Yeah, but we're either part of the solution or we're part of the problem. Jonathan, to present. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. This is application LCC 2017-64, which is to vary condition one of planning permission LCC 2017-16 to allow works to plug and abandon the borehole and to restore the site to be undertaken between the 1st of April and 31st of October 2018. And that's a site called Beckinsall Exploration Site um, in Banks Enclosed Marsh in West Lancashire. Um, this first slide shows the application site. This is a hydrocarbon exploration site located off Marsh Lane, which is the road here, um, and is accessed um, which is between Beckinsall and Banks. So you can see here Beckinsall Village here and Banks here, which is located off a, a private access road called Bonnie Barn Lane. The next slide shows the... Um, more detail of the site location. So this is this is Marsh Road here, um, and this is an area of arable farmland, but flat arable farmland. And this is Bonnie Barn Lane here, which provides access to Marsh Nurseries. And this is also used to access the um, exploration site in this area here. This is an air photograph here. Um, you, you can see here this is the um, area that's been used for the um, shale gas exploration. Um, this, this well was drilled in about 2011 um, and it's um, currently comprised of a, a hardcore area which is surrounded by, on the northern side, by an earth mound and with fencing uh, with an access road to Bonnie Barn Lane here. So this is a, a site layout plan. So here you, you can see the topsoil mound here which contains the, the topsoil materials that will be used to restore the site. Um, this is where the um, workover rig will be located, which is what the applicant will use to plug in the band in the borehole. And again, here you, you can see the fencing around the site to provide some security. Again, this is a view from, from Marsh Lane. Um, so you can see here the um, topsoil mound here. Um, you, you can just make out there the um, hardcore area that forms the surface of the compound. And the character of the, of the land adjacent is... Um, flat arable farmland um, that you can see there. Again, this is a view from Bonnie Barn Lane. So this is the access track um, to the compound, which is in this area here. Um, this is a view of the compound itself. So this is the wellhead. Um, so this well was drilled in 2011 down to depth of about 3,000 metres. And it was drilled with the objective of um, exploring for shale gas and within the Bowden Shale. But this well was never fracked. Um, so there's just, just, there's a, uh, just a borehole um, there um, that was drilled, which now requires to be plugged in the band and the, and the site restored. So you can see there the topsoil mound and the character of the site, which is just an open, hardcore surface. This is the wellhead here. Um, so this, this is a concrete apron that's been constructed with the wellheads here. Um, just by way of background, this site was first granted planning admission in 2010. A further planning admission was then granted in 2015, which permitted the, the um, retention of the site until the 1st of May 2018. However, as part of a planning application considered in March 2017, the date for restoration of the site was brought forward to 31st of August 2017. Also, on the March um, 17 planning admission, there was a condition which requires the applicant carry out a survey for nesting birds prior to doing any restoration works. The applicant undertook a survey of the site prior to commencing restoration works in June of this, this year but found that there was a ground nesting bird uh, with a nest um, close to the wellhead. It was therefore impossible to undertake any restoration works until the, the bird and any young had vacated the nest, which was likely to be in mid-August. The time to required to plug and abandon the, bore, the borehole and to restore the site is around three to four months, and therefore there was not sufficient time to restore the site um, within the current, with, 
in the correct season in 2017 and the applicant was therefore obliged and to allow the site to be restored in spring summer 2018 um, by not later than 31st of October 18. You will note from the report that Friends of the Earth and and Ribble Estuary against fracking consider that site restoration has been delayed for too long and that there is no need to extend the restoration dates. However, with the bird having nested on the site, there was insufficient time to restore the site in 2017. 2018 is therefore the earliest that the site can now be, re be restored having regard to the length of time required to complete the works. The need to undertake the restoration works in dry weather conditions and a range of other, other factors. The proposed October 18 end date is therefore considered acceptable, subject to a condition being imposed regarding the installation of measures to deter birds from nesting on the site, and also subject to a section 106 agreement which relates to the mitigation of impacts on overwintering birds. Thank you. I have six speakers on this item. Uh, all speakers will have four minutes to speak on the application. Speakers should keep their presentation specific to the planning issues only. If you feel that the points have already been made satisfactorily by another speaker, please do not repeat the points. Um, first speaker is uh, Gail Hodson. Just press it on to green. Good morning, members of the Development Control Committee. For those of you who sat in this committee during the previous applica application by this applicant, you will remember the frustrations expressed then as to whether the applicant would comply to any attached conditions given the track record of missed deadlines and breaches of conditions on various sites by this applicant so far. These are well documented. In 2010, this council passed an application by Quadrilla to explore for shale gas at the Beckinsale site. Conditions were placed to ensure the site was restored within an 18 month period. The reason given by this council for the conditions was to provide for the completion and restoration of the site within reasonable time scale of the in, in the interest of the visual amenities of the area and the amenities of local residents. This council considered 18 months a reasonable time scale. This condition makes clear the reasonable time scale is imposed to conform with DM2 of the Joint Lancashire Minerals and Waste Plan and the West Lancashire Local Plan policies. This reflects the importance and sensitivity of the site. So here we are now in 2017. This is the third application to extend the time to abandon and restore the site from the original application, which demonstrates extremely disrespectful behaviour by the operator. Committee, I would ask you how long we allow industrial activity to continue in the green belt on a biological heritage site next to an ecologically sensitive Ramsar site. The works to plug and abandon the site should and could have been completed last year, but there was absolutely no attempt whatsoever to do so. The site could have been completed again this year, even taking into account the timely discovery of the nesting little ring plover. But again, there was no attempt to, no attempt to do so. So what will it be next year? A teal? A turn, perhaps? Committee, can I respectfully suggest now that enough is enough and the situation needs to be brought to a head and now should go to enforcement so as not to allow the applicant to then come back at a later date yet within another application to vary conditions. Otherwise, what are we are to make of a condition that, state, that states reasonable timescale? I feel that this is not in the public interest to continue to allow this applicant to flagrantly pay no heed to the conditions attached to the application when this site could have been restored back to Greenbelt two years ago. From resident Doreen Stopforth, who is ill again this morning, good morning ladies and gentlemen, my name is Doreen Stopforth. I live in Banks opposite the Beckinsall site. I'm not here this morning to quote facts and figures to you. I'm here to try and explain how stressful it is to live opposite a fracking site. I've lived in my house for 45 years. I didn't buy the house to make money. It was a lifestyle decision. I brought my children and my grandchildren up in my home. Since 2011, when Quadrilla drilled the well ready to frack, I've had nothing but anxiety and stress as they have not adhered to any conditions. 
either asking for extensions or changing what they actually are doing until 2015 when they announced they were actually going to plug and abandon the well and return it to agricultural use. That was two years ago and it still hasn't happened. The stress of their unpredictability is too much to cope with. This is why I'm here and this is why she would be here today to ask if you would refuse the extension they are asking for and for the council to take some enforcement action. Could you wind up now, please? Certainly, on extending any further uh, conditions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, thank you. Next speaker, Mrs. Argreaves. Good morning. Um, my name is Amy Hargreaves, and I'm here today to represent my mother, Mrs. Barbara Cook, who is a neighbour and we are also local landowners. We object to this application. This matter has dragged on far too long. As nearby residents, we believe it is time Lancashire County Council dealt with the matter effectively by placing a non-negotiable end date on these operations and return this land to agricultural production. The original planning permission in 2010 was for a temporary change of use from agriculture. This was given permission on the basis and this was a condition that the site development, drilling operations and site restoration would all be completed within 18 months from the start of the development. Seven years later, Lancashire County Council is being asked again for another extension. This is the third application to plug and abandon this site. The existing permission, LCC 2014-0046, requires restoration of the site to be completed by the 1st of May 2018. If the council believes that this is not obtainable, then the county council and not the applicant should set a non-negotiable end date on these operations. And finally, if this latest application is granted, what will happen in 2018? And every year thereafter, if the plover or another bird selects this as a nesting site, will the applicant apply for a variation every year? In conclusion, it is not reasonable to pass this application. If the application is passed, there is nothing to stop the applicant changing conditions again, again and again. Thank you for your time. Okay, yeah, can you hear me? Is that okay? Thank you. Just one second, please. Thank you. My time could start now, please. Good morning. My name is John Powney. I'm speaking today both as a local resident and on behalf of the local community group Ribble Estuary Against Fracking, who opposed the development of the Beckinsall site since 2010. The planning application before you is planning application 0064. This application is for time extension to planning application 0016. That planning application expired on the 31st of August. It no longer exists. If planning application 0016 has expired and this application has not yet been passed, what active planning permission exists at the Back and Saul site today? The permission that covers Quadrilla to be on site today and until the end of October this year is planning application 0047. It was granted by this committee on the 1st of May 2015. It does not expire until the 1st of May 2018. Planning application 0016 limited the time the applicant, be on, the applicant would be on site till the 31st of August. Planning application 0047, however, allows works to continue until the 31st of October 2017, an extremely important fact that was not mentioned in your officer's report. So why is the applicant not on site today? Let us consider the timeline of the Little Ring Plover sighting and how that affects restoration this year. The applicant states that the Little Ring Plover eggs were sighted on the 16th of June. An initial visit by RSK, who are not Quadrilla's appointed ecologist, provides a note as evidence of the presence of a nesting plover. Only one site visit took place. The applicant rightly states it takes 25 days for the eggs to hatch and 27 days for the birds to have fledged. That is correct. The Wildlife and Countryside Act confirms these timelines. The site is therefore legally accessible for development on the 6th of August 2017. Work under planning application 0016 
could have resumed until the 31st of August 2017 when it expired, after which date work can continue under planning application 0047 until the 31st of October this year. There were over 12 weeks available this year between the 6th of August and the 31st of October. The applicant states that it will take between two to five weeks to plug and abandon the site. So again, why is the applicant not on site today? You may hear an argument that the applicant could not restore the site under the noise constraints of 42 decibels agreed under planning application 0047. The government recognises that it is not always possible to guarantee work within agreed noise limits, so makes concessions for site restoration activities. This noise concession was mentioned by your officer in March of this year when he reported to this committee regarding the application to alter the noise constraints found in 0016. Your officer quoted from the National Planning Practice Guidance, which states that a high noise level of 70 decibels may be appropriate, appropriate for such short-term restoration operations. He also reminds members that the two nearest properties to the site are in the landowner's control and the next nearest properties are local to Marsh Road at considerable distance from the site. The government extra noise allowance is permitted for eight weeks in any one year. That means eight weeks in 2017 at 70 decibels and eight weeks at 70 decibels in 2018 with no neighbours to complain. There are no noise restrictions stopping plugging and abandonment and restoration of this site this year. In conclusion, planning application 0016 has expired. 0047 is extant. And finally, I am sure members will be familiar with the fact that Lancashire County Council was one of the first local authorities to sign up to the Government's Enforcement Concordat. This policy commits the County Council to good enforcement practice and procedures by setting out the standards of service that the public can count on. Very quickly, after seven years, the public are entitled to expect this Council to exercise its enforcement powers or present an acceptable plan which removes the possibility of the applicant being able to do as he pleases which may well happen. Thank you. I'll start again. My mo good morning. My name is Chris Cannon. I'm a resident of Singleton, living very close to Quadrilla's site at Grange Road. And I'm here today to speak on behalf of SAFE, a group of residents who are concerned about the impact of Quadrilla's activities on local communities and their apparent disregard for, and for and manipulation of the planning system. Over the last seven years, we have followed the activities at both Beckhamsall and Grange Road, and it is obvious that they're following similar patterns. Yeah, I, it, it does relate to the Beckhamsall yeah, one, yeah. So, yeah. A brief history demonstrates how these sites applications have developed. They were temporary change of use from agri agriculture. They were granted with conditions for 18 months. And then in 2014-15, Codwiller made new applications at both sites for monitoring activities. None of those monitoring activities have taken place and so we're now in a position where Beckinsale are requiring a time extension. This, at Range Road, the application was overturned by this committee. It went to an appeal for an, and gave Quadrilla another nine months. There's been no activity on the Grange Road site as well since the decision. So you're seven years later, we have a company who appear to be unable to abandon and restore the site at Beckinsale within the conditions. These applications are not only extending the time that agricultural land is taken out of production, but also have continued impacts on the environment, time and cost implications for the council, and uncertainty and concern for residents, as you've already heard. The history raises the questions of Quadrilla's intentions and leads us to ask the following questions in relation to Beckenstall. Why apply for planning permission for pressure monitoring? and then abandon the idea? Have the reasons for this necessity vanished? 
Having stated that they were not going to undertake pressure monitoring, why not proceed to comply with the conditions for abandonment and site restoration once that decision is made? Is the company financially overstretching itself? Are these all delaying and manipulating tactics to keep the sites, sites open? We ask you, in conclusion, we ask you to consider those questions and the impacts of uncertainty felt by local residents. We'd also like to make you aware that a decision today that you make today may set precedents and have impacts on future applications, certainly at Grange Road, from a company who have lost residents' respect by consistently breaching planning conditions, not implementing planning applications, and very poor liaison with re local residents. We ask that you refuse this application and issue an enforcement notice to restore the site to a timetable set by you to comply with planning policy DM2. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Stenner. Hello, I think the mic's still on. Hi. So my name's Pollyanna Steiner. I'm representing Friends of the Earth, England, Wales and Northern Ireland today. We wish to object to the application being considered linked to the third delay of plugging, abandonment and restoration of the Beckensall Exploration Site. It's been clear from the start that any fracking exploration was unsuitable at this location due to its proximity to Hundred End, Ribble and Alt Estuaries, Special Protection Area and Ramsar, its Greenbelt designation, its status as Biological Heritage Site and now the nesting of a protected species found on site. Since 2002, the site's been subject to over eight different applications linked to energy and mineral exploration, none of which have led to production, five of which have been linked to fracking exploration, including three variations to delay the site's restoration from the original 18-month time frame imposed by the 2010 application. The Mineral and Waste Policy DM2 requires completion and restoration of the site within a reasonable time scale, as the previous planning officer, Stuart Perigo, asserted back in 2014 when addressing this committee that two years would ensure land would be restored back to agriculture. Yet no work has been carried out at this site since 2011 and it was originally due to be restored in 2012. Since the original 2010 application 0973, the current developer has repeatedly sought to delay the restoration despite original permission being for, and I quote, temporary change of use of field from agriculture to a site for the drilling of an exploratory borehole and testing for hydrocarbons. The reasoning in the 2010 report was that notwithstanding primacy of mineral exploration and national policy, all effects, including landscape, highway, noise, ecology and lighting, would be acceptable because they could be conditioned and would be temporary due to be restored in 18 months. Seven years down the line, here we are back at committee with the same developer again seeking more time because it suits them to keep the site open and prolong the aforementioned temporary environmental effects. Our view is that Quadrilla should not be given further time than is absolutely necessary to restore the site in light of them wasting this council's own planning department time and resource, given the context of their history of planning breaches at this site and reapplications. As members are aware, earlier this year, Quadrilla submitted two applications to increase noise level thresholds and rig heights linked to restoration. Both, in our view, were detrimental to local resident amenity and visual impact, but they were granted. It then came to light within the officer's report that the other permission, the section 73 application linked to 0047, was not in fact implemented. No pressure monitoring was ever carried out by Cordrilla. As a result of this deliberate deviation, the agreed 31st August 2017 restoration timeframe isn't binding and the deadline extends to May 2018. We also posit that the presence of a nesting species, while unavoidable, does not change the fact of developer misconduct in this application. They have knowingly led this council into a labyrinth of application variations, non-material amendments, to a permission they later inform they haven't even implemented in order to trigger a loophole for a further delay. Another concern we hold is echoed by Dr Manchester, the council's own ecologist, who asked what is to stop the same situation arising next year. As the site is proximal to a Ramsar site, the likelihood is very high. We also note Natural England have not been engaged as a statutory consultee for the past two application variations, failing to honour their request in application 0047 that they be re-engaged, and I quote, should the application change or if the applicant submits further information relating to the impact of this proposal on the SSSI. As the application has changed substantially, it's of great significance that Natural England were not statutory consultees in this proposed application and in the latterly in 0016. 
as has been evidenced, the developer did not adhere to restoration conditions of 2010, 2014, yep, no problem, and 2017. It's been demonstrated at Preston New Road that also comfortable breaching operational conditions is common practice. So we would ask, therefore, that the council enforce an end to this eight-year saga via a binding and urgent time frame set for restoration. Thank you. At this point, I'll fetch it into committee. David and then Steve. Chairman, mine's, 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 a, Sorry, mine's a question David, to the... David was first. Okay. Then, okay. I've, got, I've got them in order, so if you're right, you will get, us, get to me. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to everyone who's come and addressed us this morning. Um, certainly a lot there to, to think about. Um, I went through the application myself. I think it is regrettable that this is the third time that this has come before us for... Um, extension. Um, however, we're in the situation that we're in at this moment in time and looking at timescales as we enter into the winter nesting season for wintering birds, it isn't feasible, I don't believe, that we can um, do anything other than look at the timescale that's been put before us. What I would like to do though is to strengthen condition one um, that is applied within there if possible, um, if I have the backing of committee to do so. Um, so this is around time limits. So the original condition as set out in the officer's report states that the works to plug and abandon the borehole and to restore the site in accordance with the requirements of condition 19 below shall be completed by the 31st of October 2018. If possible, with the agreement of committee and with the backing of the officers, I'd like to add into that um, that if this deadline is missed, we will um, work on a fine for the developer and um, enforcement action if the deadline is lapsed again to try and avoid this coming before us for a, a fourth occasion and to try and sort of like explain that we are, this is the, the final time that we will allow this to, to lapse again. Um, so if I would have the backing of committee and the backing of officers, if we could add that to condition one, please, um, to really make clear to Quadrilla that this is the last time we will accept this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so the current proposal is for the 31st of October. Um, if that isn't met, uh, then we would have to consider enforcement action as a normal course of events in line with our policy. Um, and look at the reasons why that wasn't delivered. Um, that's something we would normally consider. Um, we could put a note on the end of the, the planning conditions um, and advise Quadrilla to that effect. Would a fine be possible as well at that point, just to, to really sort of make it clear yeah. that, that we won't... We, this has to be completed by the 31st of October next year? We are not... We are not the, um, the kind of fining authority, if you like. That's up to the magistrate. So we would issue uh, enforcement proceedings if we felt that was appropriate. Uh, and we're getting a strong sense from the committee that that, that would be appropriate. Um, we would put a case together, take the action, and put, put it before the magistrate's court. It would then be up to the magistrates to decide um, whether the, the um, enforcement uh, uh, penalty was had been breached and whether a fine would be appropriate or not. Would it be possible then for that amendment to read that if the 31st of August 2018 um, is lapsed, we will pursue enforcement activity um, without uh, and, and sort of not look at further a further application from the um, from the applicant to extend it? Just to sort of, I, I just want it to really make clear to the applicant that actually. They, they have lapsed deadlines previously. Enforcement has been pro possible previously, and I want to make it clear to them that actually we won't consider further applications. We will follow the enforcement route if that deadline is lapsed. We, we, can, we can put a note on the uh, decision notice to say um, uh, what the committee's views on this, but we cannot stop an applicant from applying for permission. There's a legal right for an applicant, uh, as they've done in the past, uh, to apply for permissions. Uh, so we, we can't say you can't apply in the future. Yeah. 
if just a bit of clarification. If the, when it comes to the end, if they don't, I can understand what you're saying, David. If it comes to the end, then enforcement action should be taken. That that's singles it out, and and, and I think that is a, is a good condition. Right. Legal? Can I ask legal if that? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I think that's just okay. But you just need to bear in mind if you are changing the conditions, they do need to adhere to the legal uh, um, boundaries of what we mm. can put in a condition. And obviously, a notice, obviously, as far as we can go, um, as they've said, it is up to the magistrates. And we have taken enforcement actions to the magistrates' court before, so it's not like it's a new thing for us. So, if the if the bit at the end would read if after this deadline we will follow enforcement action is that yeah, yeah. yeah. okay um, I, 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 I think how it's done with the best way to do it would, would be for us to write to the um, applicant separately rather than putting a note on the plan and we would have to write to them saying <laughs> in view of this meeting <clears throat> that this is the last time that they'll consider <clears throat> an extension and therefore that's, that's, that's how we would do it rather than putting a note on the plan mission. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we need to be strong. We don't need to be to be weak and say, and suggest to them. We just tell, give them a, a letter saying that if they don't comply, then enforcement action will be taken. We just got it off legal that that can go ahead. So I'll take that as as a condition. So just must have one. Yeah, just to add, so with any enforcement action that we do take, obviously a warning letter is sent first, so we are treating the applicant in exactly the same way as we would any other applicant. So a warning letter is always sent with any enforcement action that we do. So I think the uh, removal of the note and actually the letter is, is probably more appropriate, Jonathan. Right, thank you. Right, fetching uh, Stephen Olgate. Uh, thank you, Chair. Be before I, I move on to the main issue that I wish to speak on, I'd just like the advice of the legal officer. Uh, one of the speakers spoke of the fact that the application in front of us that we wish to, uh, we're being asked to uh, amend uh, and apply a new condition to is actually no longer valid and extinct. Uh, what is the purpose, therefore, of putting a condition on a, on, a, on a planning application that no longer exists? Or, or am I reading this in too simplistic a manner? Yeah, just in terms of the um, history, which was referred to by um, one of the speakers, if you turn to page 24 of the report, there's a, in the background section that sets out the history there, um, for the most recent applications. In the 2015 application, which is the LCC 2014-47 one, that, that was for the retention of the site for a period of three years, now pressure testing. And there was a condition on that plan mission that said, um, if, if a pressure testing is carried out, the site shall be restored by a date. Mm -hmm. um, but what it didn't do is, is set out a separate date in the event that pressure testing wasn't carried out. And of course, that's what's happened um, there was never any testing carried out, but the title of that plan mission said retention for three years. So I think the proper interpretation of that permission is that the duration of that is, is three years from when it was granted, and it was granted on the 1st of May 2015. So that plan mission runs until the 1st of May 2018. Mm -hmm. So that plan mission is, is still in force. Um, so that's, that's why the residents are saying... Um, there, there was time within the, the um, bounds of that plan mission to carry out these restoration works. But I would, uh, my advice to you would be that um, there, there perhaps was time, but of course the applicant, when sure. the bird um, season finished at, uh, in mid-August, the site restoration takes four months, so therefore they'd be running into the autumn-winter period, mm -hmm. um, and there's not sufficient time between the 1st of April 2018 in the 1st of May 2018 to do all the restoration works. And that's why the applicant has, has, has sought to apply for, for, for more time, um, because the applicant doesn't want to be moving soils on this site in the winter period, given that it's best and most versatile farmland. Um, so there's all manner of reasons why um, the restoration wasn't possible um, post the bird 
um, nesting season finishing this year? Well, <clears throat> I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would dispute the fact that there isn't time between the 6th of August and the 31st of this month. Uh, according to the applicant themselves, it takes two to five weeks to cap and abandon and a further 12 weeks in order to uh, restore. And therefore, <clears throat> they could both be done in different sections. Certainly the capping and abandonment could have been done within the time scale between uh, early August and the 31st of October. However, that is not the point I'm making. If we go back to the executive summary, it states, application variation on condition one of planning application LCC stroke 2017 stroke 0016. Now, is that application live or is it not? Because my understanding, it died on the 31st of August. Now, I'm asking the legal officer now, is this application that we are considering, the, is the variation on the application we're considering, is the application still live or not? Because if it is not, I don't see how we can vary something that no longer exists. My advice on that will be... No, I want to ask well, the legal officer. Well, well, no, I'm the chairman, I'll, t I'll take the chair and go, and it's fair to me to do that. But the only thing is, and my advice on that would be that, although the, um, the, the employment mission we granted last year had an end date or had a restoration date of um, end of August 17, um, that, that planning mission had a condition for five-year aftercare period. So obviously the duration of that planning mission lasts for the restoration and the aftercare um, so that planning mission is, is still live and therefore the applicant can apply to bury that planning mission. Okay, well, So, so to clarify, that the condition that they're varying obviously was in the five-year yeah. uh, restoration period, so they are able to vary that condition if we're just dealing specifically with that <coughs> variation, which we are here. Okay, I'll move, I'll move on, Chair, to, 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 the, to the point that I want to make. I was, I was very taken with, with, with what uh, Councillor Foxcroft was, was trying to do. But I can see that there is no means by which we can add anything to this application uh, in terms of conditions that wouldn't be something that we would do ordinarily anyway. And therefore, there is a need, in my view, to give a significant incentive to this applicant to actually restore the site within the timescale that is being requested at this moment in time. And the way in which we can do that, Chairman, in my view, uh, is that we ask for a bond under a 106 agreement uh, to the tune of £300,000 uh, that the applicant has to hand that over to the County Council. The, <clears throat> there is legislation that enables us to do that uh, based on the fact that there could be uh, considerable concern over their financial uh, uh, ability to continue and therefore uh, find ourselves in a position where um, the applicant is unable to undertake the restoration required. Uh, and to back that up, Chairman, Quadrilla Resources Holdings Limited made a loss of $11 million uh, and $17 million consecutively over 2015 and 16. Uh, the applicant itself, Quadrilla Boland Limited, lost $3.9 million and $3.2 million consecutively over the last two years. Uh, and there is a, a legislation in place that enables us as a, as a planning authority to take reasonable steps to ensure that we are able to uh, make the restoration in case they don't. Uh, there has been a, a recent... Uh, uh, application by Nottingham County Council planning application 1501498 um, on the granting of permissions of two exploratory wells for hydrocarbon including shale gas uh, and they took a 106 Could agreement I ask you to keep to this application yeah I will but I'm making an example of any, any other in not in not right the okay same. Can, cannot all right there is case law chairman that uh, that planning applications of this nature, uh, the planning uh, authority can require a 106 agreement that requires the applicant to make a bond. And I therefore propose that that is added to the uh, 
recommendation uh, on the uh, application in front of us. Sorry, do you want me to, the, the, the bond, uh, the, the 300,000 figure, is that a figure you come up with for? Yeah, yeah, it's half, it's half the one that, that, was, that was proposed and agreed for two fracking, uh, two, two fracking exploration wells by a, a not dissimilar authority. Right, because so when, we, when we do take bonds, obviously, we have to show our um, figures and, and quantify how we've arrived at that bond figure, so we would have to... Well, if we if determine we, how much the aftercare would cost. So if, just if we can't if we can't introduce the bond. No, I was just clarifying how you'd arrived at the figure. I just want to know if it was well, from that or just out of the air. It's, so. it's from it's from a, a similar application right. that the chairman wouldn't allow me to elaborate on. Why I wouldn't allow you to elaborate on is because we don't take similar applications into account. We take the application that's before us. That that is all. That's practice. If it was any other application but Thorn Gorilla, we'd be doing exactly the same. So we're not changing any rules just because of this application. Right, do you want to come in, John? Just in terms of planning policy on bonds, um, the government does say that bonds can be sought in, in certain circumstances, um, but normally the, um, um, the advice from government is that, is that um, planning authorities should use the enforcement system as a way to ensure restoration of sites because there are measures already in place to enforce planning conditions including those which relate to restoration but they've not worked the, chairman have they and and those are the measures that should normally be used um the government does say that the bonds can be um, required from applicants in certain circumstances where there has been evidence of um, failure to restore sites and, and uh, <laughs> but um hang on, let me finish. including this one chairman right, right, can, can um, yeah. but of course this, and this applicant has had a number of, of um, shale gas sites around Lancashire, and two of those have been restored to perfectly adequate standards. So I would dispute that there's evidence of failure to restore the sites. Chairman, I have the, leg I have the government legislation in front of me that enables us to do this. If we do not do it, then I would be proposing that we refuse the application. Right. Well, that's your prerogative. I'm, mo I'm moving on now. Malcolm? You don't want to speak now. Right. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Um, the, the trouble with taking speakers in a particular order is the thread keeps changing. So I'm bringing you back to an earlier thread. I really wanted to check some facts before considering things myself. And this is to do with the area of enforcement, to a degree we've already discussed it. But I wonder, Andy, if you could just briefly outline to us what are the various stages of enforcement available to us? Particularly, what is the maximum step we can take? Because I need to know that before then considering the application. Thank you. I think before we get into the detail of that, we need to just remember that the applicant is proposing to restore the site. So, again, so if we, if we, if we seek to enforce then uh, what are we enforcing? Uh, we're enforcing um, a failure to restore the site in adequate time. So we would say, we would say to the applicant, uh, we would give them a time scale for completing that enforcement. So the question then is, how different is that, that time scale from what they're proposing to do anyway? So ultimately, the end point we're getting to, you're either restoring the site through a permission and through a condition, or you're not giving that permission and you're trying to enforce it. But if we went to the applicant and said, right, we know we want you to restore the site, and we're giving you a time scale in which to do that, and there have been calls to do that, we would have to consider things like the winter wildfowl season. Um, we, wouldn't want it, we wouldn't want activity to take place over winter because it would disturb the winter wildfowl. We would also have to take into account um, the reasonable duration for restoring the site. Now, the applicant has given a duration estimate uh, of an upper and lower end. The upper end of that is 19 weeks. Okay, and just to clarify a, a point which has been made by one or two other speakers, uh, there wouldn't have been enough time under the existing permissions with that 19-week period. There would have been a 12-week period between the, uh, the 7th of August 
on the 31st of October. There had then been a gap for winter wildfowl. The commission could have recommenced on the 1st of April and would have, would have finished on the 1st of May. So that would have provided a four-week window. So what we would have is a 12-week window, a gap, and a four-week window. 12 plus 4 is 16. The applicant has given an upper end of 19 weeks. So the, the, the present commission wouldn't have provided the, the, that 19-week upper, upper window. Going back to the point, though, if we go down the enforcement route, we've got to take into account the winter wildfire season and the reasonable length of time to restore the site. Uh, if, if we do the maths on that, it brings us to a date not dissimilar to the one that's been applied for. Thanks for, I mean, that was largely to do with dates and the times it takes to do various things. But it, my question was, what is the ultimate enforcement action we can take? We, we can issue enforcement notices and um, it would, it would, there would have to be uh, compliance with that notice. And if that um, compliance isn't met, we could then go to the magistrate's court. We would be in a position of saying to a magistrate, uh, this applicant has um, missed the restoration deadline by, for, I don't know, for example, five weeks, whatever it is. Um, and the magistrate would say, well, they're already, they're already three quarters of the way through restoring the site anyway, so what's your problem? So are the magistrates going to come down heavily on, on an applicant that's, say, three quarters of the way through restoring a site already? You know, I think we, these are all considerations that, that we as officers and you as a committee have got to take account of. Yeah, still haven't got an answer. Yeah, what, what, no, 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 can I just do yeah, a, a I just, just slightly just different say, track? No, let me just come in. You, you have been chairman of this committee. Um, you do know the enforcement. Are you, are you asking the question to people that don't know? Yes, I was. I was asking it to be bang up so that I'm bang yeah, up to date. Because with everything what is, is in the, is in yeah, the agenda. Sure. Uh, but you, you commented earlier, Chairman, about, about enforcement. Are we strong or are we weak? Well, historically, we've been weak, frankly. Now, what we need to consider seriously about this application is whatever colleagues agree about what we'll vote in favour of or against or whatever else, there'll be dates attached. Now, I'd, I'd follow your logic, Andrew, to, to, to actually sort out dates and then sort out clear legal action if these dates are not being met. And we take a common sense approach. We can't just simply wave this through because it'll probably, you know, who knows, come back the same next year and the year after that. You know, this has to be finished off and dealt with properly. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't be silly and say you must do it by two months' time or something. We've got to be reasonable and realistic, bearing in mind, when, you know, the, the birds and all the rest of it. So if we can sort out a time schedule, I think you've more or less got close to it in your early discussion. That's something that I would go with as long as I can have confidence the job's going to get done. Because that's the problem. It's just been dragging on, dragging on and dragging on. Yeah, Mr Chairman, I've, I've listened to the, everybody what spoke on this and, it, and I can see the problem, it, it's actually disgusting that they've not finished the job and hasn't got on with it. It's not fair on the residents of the area or anybody else. It really does need finishing. The only th thing I would say, we have to be very firm and very strong on this time limit conditions. It, however we write it down and, er and everything, and plus we should be able to monitor it to make sure they do start the work in that time period. And I think we should be able to monitor that because if they haven't started the work by Easter time, you know they're not going to be doing it. So I think we ought to do as a planning thing, actually monitor the situation. And if we see that the job isn't being started, we get onto them be before it's too late, not leaving it to the end of the condition. And if under those conditions, and we actually do have a time limit condition, and we specify and we monitor the situation, I think the application should go ahead. So I would second it. Alan? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I was going to ask for a bit of elaboration from Mr. Hayne uh, from the Planning Department on something he referred to in his introductory remarks, namely uh, an end time scale of May 2018. And if I recall correctly, the Speaker from Friends of the Earth 
Friends of the Earth also related to refer to May 18, but it may or may not have been in exactly in the same context. But actually, when Mr. Hayne was answering earlier to uh, one of the queries from Councillor Holgate, he did make this clarification that there is this three years from the 1st of May 2015, which runs to May 18. So the, abl the abl elaboration has already been given. So thank you for that. Uh, Chairman, um, first of all, can we forget fracking for the moment? This is a, this is a um, company who basically are a serial offender as far as um, planning um, uh, enforcement is concerned. Um, I know in my patch that this company basically flouts planning um, conditions repeatedly and keeps coming back for more and more and more extensions. Treat this as if it was a quarry. Treat this as if it was a tip within your division and you have a situation where obviously you have a company that is keep coming back for more um, conditions and more extensions. I feel from what I've just heard with the officers it, that the only way that we would be totally in control of this is if we now go for enforcement. I'm not saying that we're, with enforcement that we have to go to the magistrate's court tomorrow or something like that but it would put us in the, in the driving seat in the fact that we could agree periods of time for winter, um, um, uh, for, for, for the winter nesting or whatever, and we could then enforce it as, it as we want it enforced rather than give an extension today and possibly find ourselves in exactly the same position in 12 months' time. So, as I say... If we go for enforcement, we are in control. Not only that, though, we are saying to the public of Lancashire, who are concerned about fracking, that we are obviously doing what we can to make sure that this, com this company complies with its um, 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 obligations. And I sat through several, several weeks of hearings in this, in, in this, um, in this building and what the, what the public kept saying was once they've got a foot in the door, they'll change everything, that they will not comply. And I've got to say that that has been the situation with this company to date. So why don't we go for enforcement? It doesn't mean to say we're going to the magistrate's court tomorrow. It means that we can then dictate to the company the periods of time that we want them to do various work. So I move that we go for enforcement now. And as I say, it may take till the end of August next year. But the fact is that we're not going to be in the same position in October next year where the company is saying, oh, well, we couldn't do it because there was a sparrow that was nesting in a tree. We would be in a position where we can control what's going on. And we will be saying to the public of Lancashire, we are actually enforcing planning um, permissions that we grant. Can that, Chairman? It's a very elegant solution. Yeah. If you read your report, you can see that there is a lot of things put into, in place. And I hope everybody does read the reports before they come to this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the officers have actually described quite... Um, Quite, quite eloquently, actually, um, the fact that any enforcement, if we if we go down the route of enforcement, the timescale is going to be the same as the one that's here in front of us anyway. And and and, but I, I don't think there's any way that we would actually, having dealt through enforcement at a local level and seen actually how enforcement isn't actually weighted in favour of the enforcer, it's weighted in favour of the planner. I think we need to ensure that through the application we we attach the right conditions and, and a lot of those conditions are in there. I just wanted to um, ask the officers just sort of for a bit more detail around Councillor Holgate's suggestion around this um, potential for a bond um, through some sort of Section 106 agreement. I just wanted to sort of get your clear steer on whether that would be something that we should potentially go down. Should we get the amount of money that co would cover the cost of restoration of the site or do we believe 
um, I, I think sort of um, you alluded to it that, that actually this applicant has made good other sites within the timescales. I just want to really understand that balance, um, please. You're on this site, not talking about other sites. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a bond or a Section 106 agreement is, as its name su suggests, an agreement, uh, and the applicant would need to agree to that. Um, if, yeah, th there's, there's also there's also the risk that um, if we go down the enforcement route or we go down the imposition of a bond route, um, the applicant c could reasonably appeal against that, and in turn that might extend timescales. Um, so so there, there, are, there are still not the certainties that you're looking for in going down that route. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are existing procedures for us to go down, and our advice is, um, as set out in the report, that um, permission is, is given uh, with those conditions in the report, and we, uh, we take your steer, we write to the applicant about the importance of sticking to that October deadline. And, and we, uh, th that, that is our advice to, to, to you. I think if, if we start going down other routes, there isn't, there isn't the certainty uh, that I think you're looking for. That there are uncertainties in those other routes as well. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Yeah, I think just to echo what has been said, that the court process isn't as quick and as slick as we would all perhaps like to hope. You will be at the mercy of uh, court listings, court diaries, and if they feel that we have been unreasonable in not considering this, they can, can also, you know, not proceed with it and we'll be back where we started. So it's not a quick fix and it shouldn't really be used as a tool um, to schedule things in our favour, so to speak. Field now. Uh, thank you, Chairman. My recollection is that Councillor Clark, uh, before Councillor Hayes had spoken, that Councillor Clark moved that we accept the recommendation provided that the monitoring by LCC starts at the beginning of the six-month period. On that basis, I'm happy to second that. That is in line with the proposal right at the start. Uh, I don't want to. Go, if, you, if you're going to go over the same things, please try not to speak again. Um, Stephen. Well, we're not. We're, I'm going to go to the vote after Stephen's sp spoken. Then I'm going to take the amendment. But the the uh, the proposal is I'll, will be read out um, soon, straight after this. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Clearly. Uh, Members have got some significant concerns about whether or not uh, uh, this new uh, condition and time scale will be achieved uh, by the, uh, um, the applicant. Uh, and a number of people have made various suggestions as to that, as to how we can incentivize them to do so. Mine was the bond issue, which seems to have uh, uh, died in its tracks. Uh, Councillor Foxcroft's uh, proposal is was not dissimilar to what would happen anyway. So I'm going to uh, ask the experts uh, a question, which is how do we actually take control of the restoration of this site rather than being reactive but being proactive? Is there no means by which we can do that? I mean, you know, you've been at this game a lot longer than me. I would imagine there must be something somewhere if, if a bond is not acceptable, if, if conditions uh, are not uh, adhered to, and if enforcement is just ignored and we are at the mercy of the courts, is there nothing else? Or are we trying to operate with a system that is simply not up to the job? Well, the tools are already set out in the, in the um, 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 planning conditions. Like, um, and, um, um, condition one sets out the time scale for restoration, which is obviously 31st of October 2018, and that's an enforceable condition that we can enforce if that condition isn't complied with. Um, we've also, in view of the issues that happened this year in terms of the birds, um, we have 
included condition four, which um, requires the applicant to pose a, measure, um, a, a scheme of bird deterrent measures um, to ensure that the same problem doesn't happen next year as happened this year. And that scheme is designed to um, give some sort of reasonable guarantee that, that uh, the, the restoration will, will take place. But at the end of the day, if the applicant doesn't comply with um, the um, condition one, then we do have our enforcement powers that we can use. Right. Um Well, well, there's enforcement, and that that is what is the means of this committee that we can take enforcement action. You know that, um, Paul. You you put forward an amendment. Could you read your amendment out, please? Well, could I speak first of all, Chairman? Because um, I would like to answer the point that was made by the legal officer. The legal officer had said that um, one of the problems they got going for enforcement was that the applicant could appeal and that could prolong the situation. I would suggest that that appeal would be dealt with during the winter months anyway and it's not the time when we would be actually actively uh, uh, um, asking the company to enforce anything at that time. But the point again is that even if we pass this resolution today on the order paper, the um, applicant can come back they can ask to vary the conditions, they can ask to extend the limit again and again, and they can actually appeal against the decision that we make. So the point I'm trying to make is that by going for the enforcement action, it tells the company that enough is enough, and it tells the public that we are taking seriously our obligations as a planning authority and that when we give planning permission, we expect that to be carried out. Um, so my amendment is that um, we refuse this application and, take, and start taking enforcement action against the company. It, that's already been seconded. Can we move to the vote on the amendment? All those in favour of the amendment, please show. One, two, three, four. Those against? One, two, three, four, five. Two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six we've moved. Count again. All the, all the, I'll do. Yeah. Right, so the amendment becomes the substantive motion. All those in favour of the substantive motion, is it which is the amendment? Right, all those against? Same again. Now, well, now, what we want now is the reasons for refusal. The reasons for refusal, Paul. I can give you a reason as well, Chairman. Yeah, I will want it off, not off you, it's off the... There is a funny reason. <coughs> Chair, under our own, planning uh, our own planning conditions, we are obliged to ensure that the site is restored to its originality in the most 
timely manner possible. That is within our planning policy guidelines, and on that basis... We disagreed with those time, those dates. That's the point. The time, the time you manage right. is going to be the same. Right, I'm fetching, I'm fetching the planning manager in. Okay, so uh, in terms of reason for refusal, you need to state the harm and the impacts and the policies. So you need to, dem you need to, you need to set out what harm is caused uh, and what, what policies are, um, th this, is, this will be contrary to. something which is green belt um, which is a blot on the landscape and um, which is obviously causing anxiety to people living around the area it was supposed to have been um, re um, restored within 18 months and that was five years ago and so the fact is that um, the, 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 the fact is that there is no, this is prime agricultural land it needs to be restored by the company rather than being left indefinitely. So just to clarify that, we said harm to the green belt and harm to agricultural land. That are your reasons, not no others. That's it. <coughs> La would, you, would you be also saying landscape? Did you mention that? The same as the green belt, as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, the fact is that uh, it is a blot on the landscape. I did say that, basically, yes. Okay. So we've got landscape impact, green oh, belt impact, no, it's, it's and agricultural impact. There's a former word here, Yeah, yeah the, the, the wording has to come from the before. All right, the, I'll pass it over. Yet. Can you pass that? <laughs> it's the worst stuff in italics in brackets. Well, Chairman, what I've just been passed is the reason given by this council for the conditions was to provide for the completion and restoration of the site within a reasonable time scale in the interest of the visual amenities of the area and the amenities of local residents. This council considered 18 months a reasonable time scale. This condition makes clear the reasonable time scale is imposed to conform with DM2 of the Joint Lancashire Minerals and Waste Plan and West Lancashire Local Plan Policies. This reflects the importance and sensitivity of the site. I think that's partly something. Right. Would, would you be happy now that we've, we've got that and we delegate it to the officers now to, to put it into to correct wording? Okay, thank you. Just for noting, Chair, decisions taken by head of service. Thank you. Yeah, but we're either part of the solution or part of the problem. The timescales were already laid out quite clearly. Mm. They will appeal it. They're not going to lack that timescale. It's going to go far too far. It's going to go beyond the issue. It'll extend even further. And actually, we'll have the ability to make any decision now because it brings the government. There is no urgent business, but what I'd like to propose, I'll let the people leave first. We're not, I'll not mention it then. Right. <laughs>